So good morning, everyone. I hope you had fun last night. Uh, so today's topic is going to be about what goes down the drain. I'll introduce myself quickly. My name is Yanir Quinn. I'm working in Red Hat since 2016. This is my first DEF CONF, so very excited. I've been working on several projects like Overt, Qvirt, OpenShift, and some more. Okay, so let's get to the topic. Uh, on our Kubernetes cluster, when we want to manage it, from time to time we want to perform maintenance operations. Maintenance operation in our Let's call it our synonym here is node drain. So to understand what is node drain, uh, why do we need it, uh, and how we perform, we'll go through free, the three questions. So what workloads are we actually draining for our Kubernetes nodes? Why do we do that? The cause and, uh, and how. Uh, in the how section, we'll go through one or two Kubernetes APIs for a node eviction, understand the complete complementary concept of pod disruption budgets, and if we'll have enough time, I'll dig deeper in the concept of server-side drain. So we have our Kubernetes cluster, which is managing and orchestrating our uh, containerized application, and it's considered to be fault tolerant. Uh, one misconception might be that, okay, if I have enough uh, free resources and something goes down, my node co goes down, the Kubernetes scheduler would just, okay, we'll make sure that the pods will be scheduled on another node, maybe auto-scale or downscale our cluster, and everything is fine and dandy. But that's not always the case, and it's pretty much a misconception, and to understand that, we'll dig a, deep, a bit deeper uh, about the reasons and the consequences we have. So we'll start with what is being drained from the node. So we have our pods containing our containers, which are running applications, microservices, uh, and processes. Some profound examples for our world are virtual machines running on pods, as we do in Kubernetes, uh, storage pods, like in OCS. Uh, and they, these are the heavy workloads. Okay, so I want to talk about what are the reasons for uh, for maintenance, or before that, let's understand how pods are being evacuated or dropped for a specific node, uh, either intentionally or not intentionally. So we can split it to two, uh, by disruptions. So we have involuntary disruptions. These involuntary disruptions happen without uh, us intentionally doing something, or by us or by something. Some example is the classic one, hardware failure. Well, Simply my machine breaks and goes down, and my node is down. Human error happens from time to time. Let's say a cluster admin accidentally brought down a VM, and now I don't have my node. Uh, a VM can disappear on my cloud or hypervisor, uh, or hypervisor on, the, on our cloud. Kernel panics, of course. A node can go missing if I have, I have a network partitioning, and it just disappears. Uh, all of these are classic day-to-day Failures that happen not only in a Kubernetes cluster, but in your all, all other clusters that you know even 10, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, another thing is node going out of resources. Uh, I left this to the end because Kubernetes has a mechanism to handle that. So we might want to prevent these things from happening uh, if we can't evict these workloads running uh, on our nodes and uh, are gone because of involuntary disruptions. Some preventive methods can be uh, defining for a pod what actually resources it needs so, the, so our node won't, won't go out of resources. Of course, using high availability. Uh, we can replicate our applications across the, the Kubernetes nodes. Going even further, you can uh, spread the application and make it even more high available uh, using anti-affinity and multi-zone clusters. So one of the examples I talked about uh, for preventing out of resources is uh, defining in a pod uh, how, much uh, how much memory or CPU I want a container to use. In this example, we can see uh, two definitions of limits and uh, requests. So we don't want our container to cross a certain limit and cause the pod uh, 
if a, sorry, if a container crosses its limits, it probably get restarted uh, or get a runtime error. Uh, we can allow in a pod to have a certain limit if we know we'll have bursts or spikes. Uh, and usually, it will have a, it's usually a request of memory for its day-to-day -day actions. So this is one of the preventive methods. Now we're going to the most, more interesting part of our talk is voluntary disruptions. So these can be caused by either the application owner or the cluster owner. Uh, starting with application owner, we can just delete a deployment or a controller that manages, manages the pods and then the pods can just disappear. Uh, if we update a pod template, make some changes in the spec, uh, it might cause a, a restart and the pod will be evicted and then recreated by Kubernetes. Uh, also, di directly deleting a pod, although it might be by accident, can be caused a voluntary uh, disruption. Now, for cluster administrator, uh, and this, is, this comes down to maintenance. I can decide I'm a cluster administrator and I want to perform a role in update, a kernel upgrade, hardware replacement, but I know I'm going to do that and I want to prepare for that. In order to do that, uh, I will want to do it gracefully and allow my pods enough time to terminate. Uh, other example for uh, such maintenance operation, vo uh, voluntary disruption, is draining an all from a cluster to scale down the cluster. We might also want to remove some pods from time to time to allow something else to fit on uh, the node. But let's, let's focus on the top two. So this is why and also what. So no drain mean, means safely evacuating or evicting all of our pods, allowing them enough time to gracefully terminate, complete our workloads, workloads <coughs> migration, or complementary actions, and then, and then shut down the node and after the pods are rescheduled uh, somewhere else. So draining operation is comprised for two main actions. One is cordoning the node. Cordoning means I shut the node down. I don't, oh, sorry, I, sh I have a barrier on the node. I don't want to allow any new pods to be scheduled on the node because I'm going to eventually shut it down. Uh, and the complementary action of the node draining is evicting or deleting the pod if eviction is not possible. It's also possible to prepare for node eviction and just create, uh, call uh, kubectl cordon a node before we actually want to start the eviction process. Okay, so uh, the CLI for draining a node is just kubectl drain with the node name. The node becomes unschedulable. Uh, you can see it also presented as a field or uh, also a taint. It tries after the node is condoned to, to evict all pods from, uh, that are running on that node, if it can evict these pods. There are some uh, exemptions, which I'll show uh, soon. And if eviction is not supported, Kubernetes just calls the delete API. So let's start with the delete API. You can call, you can call a delete API on Kubernetes uh, node to just delete the pods. The lit API also uh, gives you a field which allows you to gracefully uh, remove the pod, meaning I'll define a certain timeout before, uh, before it kicks out the, the pods, allowing some, some workloads or some processes to finish, to complete. When we have involuntary disruptions, for example, if my node suddenly breaks down, we don't really have a chance to have this grace period. So, we might have a, some sort of chance you know, to get it in before we see a, a node comes down. Again, this is only for uh, involuntary disruption. So now we'll talk about the eviction API. Eviction API uh, came to us to Kubernetes 1.7 and above, and we use it instead of directly deleting a pod. Here we can also avoid calling uh, an external command. We can utilize this API in our uh, code base or project if we want to. And we have also finer control over the eviction process. So you can see it's pretty much looks the same like the delete API. 
with, uh, with a special kind for eviction. And another, uh, another concept that uh, coincides with this eviction API. That is pod disruption budget. So what is pod disruption budget? It basically, it limits the amount of pod that can be evicted by the eviction API to a certain limit by uh, definition you can t put on the custom resource of pod disruption budget. Some examples, uh, for example, I have a stateless front-end uh, running UI operations, and I, don't, I want to keep the capacity at 10%. Uh, I want to keep the capacity that won't reduce more than 10%. So I define a pod disruption budget with a parameter called uh, minimal available pods at 90%. Minimal available, for, for example, can be also a number of pods. Percentage make it, makes it more easier to uh, work in high, level, uh, high amounts. Uh, in a st single, st uh, single instant stateful application, um, I want to block eviction completely unless I tell it to proceed. I want to have control over that. To do so, I can just define a max unavailable zero. That means I don't want any pods to be evicted from the cluster, uh, from that node specifically. Unless I remove this pod disruption budget, I remove this limitation, and then the eviction API can go on and evict that pod. We also have uh, quorum examples, like using ETCD in a, a multi-instance uh, cluster, when I, where I can actually utilize this post disruption budget to define my quorum, uh, setting a number for max unavailable for one, or defining the qu um, minimum available pods that should stay on that node for, let's say, three out of five to maintain the quorum. So this is how the pod disruption budget, budget CR looks. It's quite simple. You have in the spec the parameters I mentioned and uh, their value, and a matching label to the pods. I'm, I want to associate the pod disruption budget. Uh, when trying to evict and a pod disruption budget exists on the pods, I can have uh, several scenarios. Uh, either it's granted, pod disruption budget doesn't block me from evicting my pods from the node. So the eviction API just goes through and we're all for good. Uh, pod dis disruption budget is not, uh, is not accepted and it's not respected. So it will block eviction and you will get an error. Uh, this, this error is 429, which is a bit weird for me. Uh, or either I have a misconfiguration, uh, assigning too many pod, uh, too multiple budget to the same pods, and that uh, resulting in an error. So sometimes that can result in a broken state. Let's say I have a controller. This controller tries to evict pods using the eviction API, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm getting blocked by pod disruption budget. So, or either my replacement pod is not ready. Let's say I terminated the pod, I need it to be rescheduled somewhere, and if it didn't uh, reschedule somewhere, I, the, the operation did not complete in my controller. Handling these solutions can be by pausing the controller's work or deleting uh, the pod actually manually or forcefully after a long time. So I was talking about the deletion API uh, as part of kubectl drain. So we have some special uh, pods uh, that won't be deleted uh, immediately. Uh, one prominent example is daemon sets, which is not that horrible to delete from a node because they'll spin up anyway. <laughs> but in order not to block uh, the eviction, you can uh, specify a special flag to ignore daemon sets and just uh, go on with that. Mirror pods won't get deleted. That are mirror pods with, uh, are uh, representing static pods in, on the node. Uh, Unreplicated -re pods. These are pods that don't have replica sets uh, deployment, and they will not won't spin up uh, because they don't have such uh, deployments of re replications. So if I'm sure it's okay to delete a pod from the cluster and evict it without without it getting replicated, I can use a, a false flag for the kubectl drain command. Also, pods with empty DIRs, if we're certain that it's okay to delete or evict them, we can just use the delete local data uh, 
flag and the, it will be deleted. Okay, so when coming out of just simple application running on pods, uh, we have some heavy workloads. Prominent uh, examples are uh, virtual machines. Let's say I'm, I want to perform an upgrade on a node or a maintenance operation, and I don't want my VMs to go down. Uh, part of the classic uh, process of that is migrating my VM. So I call a VM uh, migration by initiating a, a drain command. I don't want the VM just to go down. So I need to, uh, same, same thing goes also for storage nodes. I don't want to, I don't want the operation of draining and eviction to be eviction to be complete unless my storage were, uh, nodes were, uh, my storage process was completed, meaning replication, uh, rebuilding of storage uh, data. These are also very long and heavy transactions. So, to deal with that, we want to allow or utilize pod disruption budget with some sort of mechanism. We want to put a pod disruption budget on the node, uh, on the pods uh, running on the node. We, want, we would like to signal a controller that will uh, accompany these processes to see if eviction was successful, if the complementary action of rebuilding uh, or replicating storage nodes or migrating a VM was completed before, uh, before lifting the pod disruption budget and allowing the pods to finally be evicted. Uh, so this is one of the examples I was talking about. Uh, we've, I have here uh, a, fr a free, uh, free machine uh, cluster, which I can allow only one, one machine to go down or one node to go down, and I would like to maintain it. So I have, we have our pod uh, disruption budget controller that looks over uh, all of our nodes. And let's say I'm trying to evict one node. So first, it will, it will want to see that the process was ended. Uh, the replication of data was, uh, for example, ended. After he saw that, he will remove the pod destruction budget of maximum unavailable zero and will allow these pods to be evicted. Another scenario, I want to evict two uh, nodes at a time, but we already started one uh, process, so we also observed that. Uh, I'll mention again that I want to signal the process to begin, like via migration or replication, but how will I know that? So we can use canary pods for that. I saw a canary pod getting evicted, I will start some process to go on, migration or replication. I saw, I saw a taint on a node uh, added, so I'll start the process on migration or replication. So all of these uh, processes can be initiated or usually are initiated by kubectl uh, drain command, which is client-side command. But what happens if I would like something extra, something more? Um, I, want an, I, I want a server-side drain, meaning I just create some CRD or call, and I get some feedback. For example, if I want to use a UI to start server-side, uh, to start draining my nodes, I don't really have an option right now using the CLI command. So, Service side drain will be great for you. I want to accompany the process. I want to see what events are going on. If the, the maintenance on draining operation was completed or I have some errors. Automation, for example, I have a, a machine configuration I want to change and I want to allow the process to be as automated as possible. So entering some uh, drain commands or drain CRDs for that process will be helpful. There are some several solutions or semi-solutions currently in Kubernetes that you might take a library, put it aside, but then you get not only one solution, but 10 or 20. So a, one solution for draining, for server-side drain, would reduce the use you know, of uh, multiple solutions, so basically will look, look the same. I see I have one more minute, but uh, I want to, to show you a quick demo of something uh, we wrote uh, in Kubert for server side drain. So I'll show you. It's, it will be really quick. So one less question, but I think it's better. So, okay, so this is an example of a controller, uh, controller I wrote uh, utilizing server side drain. Okay, 
So I have a cluster uh, with one node on it. Uh, sorry, we have our, uh, our controller, which we call node maintenance operator, which is running on node one. This is a cluster of two nodes. And now I see all the pods running on node number two. And now to create a server side drain, I'm using a, a CR, which is uh, for node maintenance. So in that CR, I just, just give it a general name, the node I want to evict, and the reason for that. Of course, later on, you can add some st more fields like status and uh, events. So I invoke this CR. The controller has detected that I created a CR for that. It already called on the node, as you can see down there, that the node is not scheduled. And we can see node two uh, has uh, been called on and scheduled and dis is disabled. And also, most of the pods have been evicted except the daemon sets that are running here on the nodes. Also taking a look at the controller logs, you can see all the pods uh, that could be evicted were evicted. So ending that process or Returning to node, uh, switching the node back up, we just delete that, uh, that CR for the specific node. And the node becomes schedulable, schedulable again. <coughs> and all the nodes are ready. So that was a very simple example, but it was a bit fast forward. A lot of processes happened in the background. Nodes were evicted. Uh, before that, uh, the node was called on. All, all of our workloads migrated or were rescheduled on different uh, nodes. And uh, that's a nice example for server side drain. If you want to know more, I will be happy to share some links afterwards on the slide for uh, the node maintenance operator uh, and so on. So yeah, so now I have three minutes for questions if you guys have any. <laughs> Should have made the demo longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ah, yeah. So the question was if I can install these features by CLD or, or operator. Uh, I'll refine that. Uh, this specific feature exists as an operator. It's encapsulated as op an operator, but it's basically a controller, which has its custom CRDs. You know, it has its CRDs. Once you deploy this operator, let's say, in an OpenShift environment, you will, uh, you will have uh, the uh, custom CLDs. You, you, can just create the specific uh, CR for draining the node, and the controller will detect that and just start the process. Yes? Um, so you set your own controller, so where do you set the Kubernetes side? Good question. So the question is if it's our own controller, and where do we stand on the Kubernetes side? Uh, so we wrote this controller out of a need because it wasn't server-side drain didn't exist in Kubernetes. There is a Kubernetes enhancements process. By the way, if someone here is from Signal, come talk to me later. <laughs> uh, an enhancement uh, procedure on Kubernetes to get it uh, accepted and make life much easier for everyone uh, if we have this type of operator. It doesn't necessarily have to, has to be one-to-one, -one, but the concept is the same concept. So uh, a cap is pending. It's getting attention, but, and more use cases, but uh, I think that is currently the stage right now for service side training Kubernetes. Uh, they are not too eager to push it forward at the moment, but we keep bugging them. <laughs> Another question? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>